and that he rewards those who seek him. So what did I do? I he used the coin of heaven. 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 I tell everyone who will listen. Certain words in the course of long use gather so many barnacles of connotation that they almost cease to mean anything at all. Then the only thing to do is to scrape off the barnacles. Such a word is pure, or pure in heart, for they shall see God. When you read it, with the present meaning that was attached to the word, you wonder which is the more difficult. The condition imposed upon man to see God or seeing God. And that is not the meaning of the word pure. The Greek word, kastalos, translated pure, means clear open, free, unlimited. It is used for a tract of land that has been cleared of trees, therefore free, unobstructed, and, well, unlimited. Blessed are they whose mental horizon has been so purged, so cleared of the trees of traditional wrong thinking, that they know that God is all, and all is God. They are now free from the tyranny of second causes. You do not have to work upon yourself to become pure, to see God. In other words, a pure heart is the consequence, not the condition, of seeing God. The moment you see God, your heart is purified of all secondary causes. And you can turn to the left or the right or to anything in this world, for you'll find the only source of the phenomena of life. Now, the word see, for this is taken from the Greek. The word see and to know are the same word in Greek. Here we are told that I, if I am pure in heart, and only if I am pure in heart, I will see God. And yet in the same gospel, I am told that no one has ever seen God. The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. Then I am told, no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. You can take the words see and know, and they're interchangeable. No one has ever seen God. No one knows God. But the Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. I can tell you the thrill and the shock in store for you when you are revealed as God. I could tell you from now to the ends of time and I cannot persuade you to the point of real conviction. 
it takes the sun to convince you. And when the sun stands before you, everything is done. At that moment, you for the first time know God. And you see him only by knowing him, because to see and to know are the same in Greek. Now you really know who God is when he stands before you, and even before he calls you Father. You have no doubt in your mind as to who he is and what you're looking at. You know your son. At that very moment, you know God, and not before. You might have heard it, you might have read it, but you are not persuaded to the point of real inner conviction until you know it in this manner. So no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And if the Son sets you free, you are free free indeed, and only the Son can set you free. And so when he comes, and he will come, let the whole vast world rise in opposition to what I'm telling you. It makes no difference to me whatsoever. I know, I've experienced it. And oh, what a thrill, and what a shock, when you go to bed perfectly normally as a simple man, and have an experience of this nature, and suddenly you are startled. You, your simple little being that you are, you are God, but you can't deny it. The son stood before you, and he was, had no other father. You are his father. And when you have it, then you and I must be one. And when the whole vast world has it, we must be a unity. We must be that unity spoken of in Scripture as the Elohim. That compound unity, one made up of others, the whole vast world will know God. So that this seeing God, based upon the purity of heart, <coughs> is not something that you go, you set about to do. I can't conceive of any man in this world actually persuading himself by changing of this and changing of that, that he is pure of heart. When he's living in the world of Caesar, where everything here dies and things are always in turmoil, that he would actually judge himself emotionally or in any other way, mentally, as pure, as he calls the word pure. But you're instantly free of all obstruction as the secondary causes, the minute the Son reveals you as God the Father. So I say, it is consequent. It is not the condition of seeing God. And so the minute he stands before you, instantly, that whole vast wonderful world of yours is cleared of all obstruction. Now you know what cathartic means. Well, we use the word as a purge in our world. We speak of a cathartic, that's the root of the word, to purge, to open, to set free, to completely leave open a channel so there's no obstruction whatsoever. Not one tree can stand in its way. And so when this track is completely cleared, and it's cleared the minute you see David, at that moment there is no other cause. And until that moment I turn to this, to that, and to the other, these secondary causes, and live in a horrible state, for that is the greatest tyranny of the world, the belief in secondary causes. So here, the word pure, let no one frighten you, that you've got to set about to purify yourself, as the world thinks that is pure. Because who knows the secrets of a man, but the spirit of a man? So who can look at a man and say, he's a pure man? How does he know he's a pure man? By his standard of purity, no man is, including himself. But by scriptural standard, the minute you see David, and David reveals you as God the Father, then all the trees, all the obstructions, everything in your world that came between you and self, 
this affair and you're the only cause of the phenomena of your life. And you go through life now, simply bring it into your world, the things that you would like to entertain in your world. No matter how difficult it seems to be, you see it, you know there's only one cause, and so you simply rearrange the thing you see, you don't throw it away, you don't discard it, you rearrange it and in your mind's eye you re-photograph the image. And re-photograph the image and let life develop that negative and produce it on the screen of space, and it will. So here, blessed are the pure in heart, that fixed beatitude, which seems so difficult to most people to interpret. And I haven't found one interpretation in scripture, all the commentaries, I haven't found one that will go back to the root and show us exactly what it is. I have what is considered the grandfather of all interpretations, which is the interpreter's Bible. They do not touch it. They will admit it's the most difficult of the Beatitudes, this sixth one. But they can't touch it unless you go back to the root, unless you have the actual experience of what it means to actually purify and take all the trees out of man's mind, purify the mind. And it can't be done until he stands before you. And you know, without any doubt, who you really are. When you know who you are, there is no secondary cause, none whatsoever. And then comes the vision. Here my wife gave me a vision two months ago. There was no occasion to tell it, but it would fit. He said we were in this fantastic, magnificent, enormous apartment in a palace. And we were the gateway into a new age. But the age in which we were was a police state. And we were constantly being searched, but we were not molested. We were completely free, not one little bit ever happened to us. But this palatial place with a full complement of servants. And while the vision lasted, he seemed to know these people. The servants in the kitchen, the servants in the other areas of the enormous apartment, the butlers, the private secretaries, all seemed to know us and we knew them. But our position was the gateway into freedom from the place of complete slavery, like behind the Iron Curtain. And when the searchers came, they came and our guests, we always entertain guests for dinner. Not more than six, therefore they made eight of us, she and I, and the six who came as our guests. And I would explain to them the way of escape. I would tell them the one and only way into freedom. But strangely enough, as I was telling them about the way into freedom, they were already simultaneous at that moment, I am telling them, and they were already at their destination. It was the strangest experience here. You are explaining to them the way of salvation, the way of freedom. And yet at that moment, they were already, although physically present before us, they were already at their destination. And when these people came to investigate all the searches, they simply left and went to their quarters, their rooms, behind these panel doors and these tapestries. And they never touched us, but they came and they never found anyone. No one could ever touch anyone who came to us. And strangely enough, she said, as it all took place so naturally, I knew that it was all organized and actually directed from above. That we were the gateway explaining the way but from above, everything was organized, and there it was directed. So anyone who came to us for the escape were brought to us by those who directed the whole thing from above. Here is a true picture. No one comes unto me save my father calls him. So I and my father are one. But that depth of my own being does not let the conscious surface mind know who he is calling and when he is calling. Rarely would he let me know that this one is coming and then he comes in a month, he comes 
sometimes in a year. But they will tell when to expect it. But normally I am not advised as to when, but the one who speaks it all is my own being, is from the depth of my own soul, who is telling me. And he will come, or she will come, or they will come. And sometimes they are even late in the coming. But the father is not wrong, because man still is free not to come. In my own case, when a friend of mine who was just one year short of graduating from Fordham University as a Catholic priest. He inherited two million dollars and proceeded to lose the entire thing in one year on Wall Street. All that he saved was some beautiful paintings that his father left him. And an old, old, old packet. It's old packet car. He should have burned the thing up. But when he would sleep on the park bench because he had no money, he paid ten dollars a month rent at storage for the car to be out of the weather. But he lost his two million dollars because he did that. When he told me he met a man that I would enjoy meeting. And this man, he thinks, would like to meet me. He thinks we had much in common. Well, because he told me I wouldn't go near the man. I postponed going near my friend Abdullah for six months. And then I ran out of excuses. I had no other excuse to give him. And this Sunday night, I said, all right, Dave, I'll go with you. And so I went with him. I came through the door and sat, took the first chair, and the meeting had just begun. And Abdullah broke the meeting as he started to talk to those who were present. He broke the meeting and he came over to me and called me by name. He said, Neville, you are late. You are six months late. And I said to him, well, I've never seen you before, and I had no appointment to see you, so how could I be six months late? He said, the brothers told me you were coming, and to expect you, and that's six months ago. Well, it was six months ago, and I postponed it and postponed it and postponed it because I had no trust in his judgment of anything that would interest me. Because the man in my eyes was a failure, a complete failure, and I judged my appearances. And he tried to get me to come to meet a man that really was very influential in my life. So I know from my own experience when it actually happened to me, when someone is coming into my world, I know, and they too may delay. They may have certain little barriers, little trees to overcome. But the real overcoming of all the things is when it is revealed to you who you really are then all the things that obstructed your view up to that moment, they vanish completely. So that it is not something you've got to make happen in order to see God. Seeing God removes all the trees. Therefore, this so-called pure heart is the consequence, not the condition of seeing God. So when we read in Scripture that no one has ever seen him, only the sun reveals him. It's true. I can see I am. I can see I am's manifestations. I see the necessity of a creative imagination clothing itself in concepts of itself. And I can see myself clothed in concepts of myself. When scripture speaks of David, this is he, rise and anoint him. And then the Spirit of God came mightily upon David from that day forward. What does it mean? He's clothed with David. But then who is David? You are David. You're doing the will of your father. He'll put you through all the furnaces of affliction because he cannot give his glory to another. How can I give my glory to another? He can't give it to another. He has to make it you himself. And so... He clothed himself with David, as he clothed himself with Gideon. He clothed himself with you, and you are doing the will of your father. So I have found in David, the son of Jesse, which is I am, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. You are doing your father's will. But everything that you have imagined, you are doing it. And when you look into the world and you don't like what you are seeing, don't, maybe you haven't cleared it yet because you're not completely cleared of the obstruction until 
you know God. When you know him, because the Son reveals him, then you know God and you have no obstruction. Until then, there are still secondary causes. And you will say, well, now, he did it, or she did it, or they did it. All the conditions did it. Today we have, they say, a depression. We have a recession. We have unemployment. And so we turn to all these secondary causes for our present restriction or failure. And it isn't that at all. Someone is ill, and they blame a condition. It's not the thing at all. I can tell you of numberless things that would contradict completely the findings of so-called science today and blaming this, that, or the other for a certain effect. And I could turn to just as many on the opposite side who never did the things that they claim you must do in order to have the effect and they ask, but then why? Why does this happen to this crowd who never subjected itself to the test that you have given and yet they the same effect? We are emotional filters, and we bear the mark of our prevalent emotions. So what is that prevalent emotion that you and I are entertaining morning, noon, and night? I can entertain the limitation of failure. Or I can even get into a cycle, so that at every season of the year, at a certain season, it could be spring, summer, autumn, winter, where things seem to go down. And year after year, they will go down. No matter what I have in the spring, if the winter is when it goes down, it'll go down if I don't get out of that cycle. And I believe that simply in some tree that is not yet removed, on the other hand, let me encourage you, you can't remove it by taking thought. You can't remove it by working on yourself. You'll remove it that day when David stands before you. And may I tell you, he will stand before you. Every one he will stand before and when he stands before you, and you know that he is your son, you know who you are. For David is the son of God. There is no other son of God, if you read the scripture correctly. But when you know how to read scripture, you will see that when these evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're all anonymous names, when they wrote their gospel, they were not writing biography. They were writing theology. They were not writing secular history. They were writing the history of redemption. It's all the difference in the world. Men not knowing this, they read it and read it as secular history. And they think, here is the biography of a man called Jesus. The whole story of Jesus, from his birth through his ascension into heaven, is to those who understand who he is, a sign. A sign granted by God to those who will receive it. But the signs of God's wonderful redemptive activity were not the signs that Israel was expecting. Therefore, they completely rejected it. They would not accept it. When I tell you, this is what it is. You are born from above, and you are born in this manner. And you rise from the grave, and the grave is your own wonderful being. It's your own skull. Then, if you don't believe that because of the trees of false teaching, well then, you'll reject it. I'm telling you the truth. But if you've been conditioned through these traditional wrong thinkings, these trees must then be removed. I can aid you to take a few out, but they will not all go until that last one when David stands and confirms all that I tell you. So all that I have told you and all that I will continue to tell you is simply in Scripture, but it is not biography. It's theology. It's simply the knowledge of God and God's way of redemption. That's the entire story. But if I take it as the world takes it, as biography and simply secular history, well then I miss the point completely. So, you will see God. And when you see him, you will say within your heart, well, I didn't think myself qualified. For you don't feel any change. You're so capable of a violent act the very next day if someone should injure the one you love. If someone this very night injured my daughter, or my wife, or those that I love. I am quite capable of the most violent act. And yet I am free of these trees of traditional wrong thinking. And that means I am pure in heart. But I make no claim to the purity based upon man's concept of purity. 
has a thing to do with any purity as the world thinks it. He turned to the harlot and says that the one who has no sin, let him cast the first stone. And from the oldest to the youngest, they all left, because none felt within themselves good enough to cast the stone. Because he interpreted the entire story as a psychological story. That if you lust after a person, well, the act has already been committed. You may restrain the impulse, but he tells you that isn't good enough. But then who on the earth could stand before me and tell me he's never had the impulse? Unless he was castrated at the time he was born, and then he doesn't even know, so he could restrain nothing. He has nothing to restrain. If he was removed at birth from the possibility of lusting, but if he was not removed at birth from that possibility, then he would stand before me and tell me that he is never lusty. And I will say, well, you're a liar. As far as I'm concerned, you're a liar. Whether you be male or female. And so, that you've never had the impulse to get even. Don't tell me you haven't. Don't tell me you haven't had the impulse, and still are capable of the impulse, to hurt if someone should hurt the one you love more than you love your own self. And yet, you are pure in heart the day you see David. For the minute you see him, you know, the whole vast world has collapsed as far as you are concerned. The whole thing has collapsed. And now you no longer can turn to this, that, and the other and blame it or praise it for anything that's happening in your world. You are simply within yourself. You are God himself. You are the God. Creating good, bad, and indifferent in your world. A friend of mine in the audience tonight, he said, I had this vivid dream. My wife and I, and here we are, and the world is coming to an end. The whole thing is coming to an end. It began to shake. A wind, the unearthly wind came up, and then the rain like a flood, and then the earth is shaking. And I said to myself, well, the earth has gone out of orbit. I wasn't afraid of death, and my wife, she wasn't afraid of death. But I thought the whole thing was simply coming apart and coming to an end. That's a wonderful adumbration. Read it in the 13th chapter of Mark. Read it in Matthew. You see these buildings? Not one stone will be left standing upon the other, but it will be turned down. That's when the Son of Man is coming. That's the end of the age. Well, in your case, you had a most wonderful adumbration. And you're not given these adumbrations when you're far removed from the actual event. And this thing happens to you, be watchful. It's coming. This is simply a foreshadowing in a not altogether, I would conclusive way, no, the way you saw it. But when it happens, when the whole thing collapses, and the ideas by which you lived in the past, you no longer can live by them. You just can't live by them. Nothing external, the whole thing is internal. The whole drama of life is a psychological drama, and now you know it. So your vision is perfectly marvelous, perfectly wonderful. Others are finding themselves interwoven in their lives, two and three and four together, all interwoven as though this thing has been going on and going on over and over again. It has been going on. Before the world was, we were one and yet individualized. We were brothers, greatly in love, a love beyond the wildest dream of man. And we deliberately and purposely came down into this world of horror for a purpose. And as the poet says, when we are so curious about why are we here, he said, be patient. Our playwright will show in some fifth act what this wild drama means. So here we have it in four acts, like the four corners of the universe. Wait, be patient. In some fifth act, he's going to show what the wild drama means. And it will be beyond the wildest dream of man, the glory that comes out of the horror to which we go here. So what has to it? You and I agree to dream in concert, and we haven't violated that place. We still dream in concert. So we can share the same room, share the same events, See them a little bit differently, because through different eyes, but the same event. You see it just a little shade differently. So when you read scripture, don't take anything for granted. For this simple little statement, I have heard so many 
ministers from the pulpit take that sixth beatitude and they made, well, the strangest thing out of it. They frightened the people to death. But they went through that door after the service and they wondered how on earth would I ever see God? For they knew in the depth of their soul, if they had to be pure, as he pointed out what you had to be, well then you could never see God. But you'll never see him, say you see him through the sun. Because you are spirit. You don't look into the mirror and see God. You see him in his son. Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. And as you're told, if scholars are not convinced that the second psalm is that of David, but read the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. And you say, O sovereign Lord, creator of the heavens and the earth and the seas and all therein, who by the mouth of our father David, thy son, did say, then he quotes the second psalm. If you want any confirmation as to who actually wrote that second psalm, read the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, which is written by the author of the book of Luke. And in the book of Luke, you read the words in the 20th chapter. Why did David in the Spirit call him Lord? If David does call him Lord, how can he be David's son? For in calling him Lord, he confessed he was his father not his son and now this is written by the son as told us in the fourth chapter of Acts and first revealed in the second chapter of the book of Psalm and I will tell of the decree of the Lord he said unto me thou art my son today I have begotten thee so here the drama is really in you the whole drama is in every individual in this world and it simply only unfolds in man <laughs> and when it unfolds in man what in this world is worth more than the unfolding of the drama in you if you own the whole vast world you wouldn't leave it for this will all vanish anyway so what does it matter if you own the whole thing <coughs> but one thing they can't take from you is the being that you really are that essential being is God but if you don't know it, well then, it's like a fabulous fortune of which you are totally unaware. Therefore, it is non-existent. It means nothing to you if you are totally unaware of it. But when you are aware through the Son that you are God the Father, then you are set free. For if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now he said, I will be with you a little longer. And then I go to him who sent me. Yet he who sent me has never left me. He and I are one. Oh, do show us, oh Lord, show us the Father. I have been so long with you, and yet you do not know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. If you see me. But then who are you who is speaking? At one moment, if you read scripture properly, he is speaking in the capacity of the Son. Therefore, David is speaking. At another moment, he is speaking in the capacity of Father. And therefore, it is the invisible spirit speaking. But no one has ever seen him. Who could say he has seen him? Until you see him in spirit, you can't see him here. All these are masks. So what on earth could ever look like him? No. You will know exactly who you are when you see David. Because the Father and the Son are one. And you will actually see in David what you matured must be. And then I know it's the same face into whose body I was incorporated for he is the image, mature image, of David. And so when he embraced me and we became one body, one spirit, and then I was sent into the world. From that moment on, though I still looked like Neville, the Neville that was before, and still look like that in Neville now, it is that being into whose body I was incorporated and with whose spirit I became one that David recognized and called me Father. For he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. And so there is only one being resurrecting. So the resurrection is not over, it is taking place. And so he said to Timothy, 
They are those who preach the resurrection is fast. They are misleading people and turning them from the faith. As he came into his letter to Timothy, because he said, The time for my departure has come. I have finished the good work. Well, now you must tell Timothy not to fall into that trap and teach that the resurrection is over. It has begun, but it is taking place in everyone and must take place in everyone. So the Christ of whom he spoke is that universal Christ that is buried in everyone. And in everyone, but individually, he must rise. And the same pattern foretold in Scripture by which he rose must take place in man. He came out of one place where he was buried, and there's only one place, and it is named Skull. Luke does not minimize the word, neither does John. Even though he will give you the word Golgotha, he will translate the word Golgotha. Golgotha means skull in Hebrew. But in some translations, they don't even give you the Hebrew word. They say, and he was crucified and buried on Golgotha. So there's only one place you're ever going to rise. And you aren't going to rise in forest long. You're going to rise out of your own wonderful skull while you're walking the earth. That's where you're going to rise. Save your money if you're planning any little plot to bury the little body, for you aren't going to ride there. In fact, you will never be taken there. Let them destroy this body, let them turn it, turn it into ash. It means nothing. You will still be in that immortal skull where you were buried in the beginning. And from that skull, you're going to rise. And all the imagery of scripture will surround you when you rise. And then will come this wonderful unfolding pattern, for there's only one pattern that must repeat itself through the indwelling in man of Jesus Christ. Were he not in us, then he could not repeat the drama. But the same thing as told in the gospel, that same drama unfolds itself in the individual. And he is the Lord, who is the father of the only son, and that son is David. So when you read the story, if you have a concordance, and I recommend if you don't have one, and you plan ever to get one, the best that I know of is strong. Strong concordance. It's exhaustive. It has every word. Don't buy the metaphysical concordance, and not the metaphysical dictionary, these things. That's all, well, speculation. This is simply the original town translated in the original meanings of the word used when it was first put into the scroll. Now you can take from this many definitions. For instance, we took tonight the word C. Well, one definition given in concordance, in strongest concordance, is to show self, to experience. Well, to experience, David, is to see. But you must experience it. Not hearsay, it must be an experience. So that is to see. And so he who sees the Son, then knows the Father. If you knew me, you would have known my Father. And yet I and my Father are one. So to experience David is to know God. And you know God as the Father of the one that you are now looking at. And the one looking at him is yourself. And you feel that Father-Son relationship. Now, that is completely in conflict with the whole vast Christian world concerning the story of Jesus Christ. And yet I've been sent to tell it. Tell it not as hearsay, but tell it as experience. And so I share it with you. And not eternity could ever deny it. Because you're going to have it just as I have told you. You're not going to bury it at all, because there's only one pattern. And that pattern will unfold within you. And when it unfolds within you, you will depart this world that is a police state. And maybe I will still be there giving the sumptuous dinner party, not more than eight. And eight is the number of resurrection. There were six guests, and six is the number of man. And eight is the number of resurrection. So the six, which is man, now will be set free. So here this sumptuous, wonderful dinner. And not one can fail, because as I am telling them the way of escape, they were at that very moment already at their destination. 
So not one who came to search the house could ever find one of my guests. And as they came, the butler announced the authors are here, and out my guests would go behind the tapestries and the panel wall into their quarters. And then that very night, always the night of the banquet, they escaped. And that was the vision. So I tell you it's a true vision. You bring it back and you know, and she's a strangely now. I knew them and I was there in the vision. But on waking, you were the only one that I really knew. The others were there for a purpose. And you were playing a part that came from above. For the whole thing was organized and dictated and controlled from above. And there you sat and explained the procedure of departure. And yet, as you told them, they were already at their destination. So no one could have found them anyway. But they went through the means of searching the house. And they came several times in the interval, but always at the end of a banquet. They got guests. There were always six they left. And they were set free from this police state. Or with this whole vast world, whether it's behind the Iron Curtain or outside of the Iron Curtain, we are still in a police state. The whole thing. And it's an escape from this world, this age, into that age, where I play the part of the gateway, explaining how it's done. Well, I'm explaining it now to you, how it's done. You are here dreaming the dream of life. And the day will come and come suddenly, like a thief in the night, no warning. You would have adumbrations, like my friend, with the world coming to an end. And the whole thing is taking place around him. You would have an adumbration like that or something similar. But the actual thing when it does happen will take place all within your skull. And a vibration that you think or you will interpret it to be final. You wonder how you could ever survive what is taking place now. And then, instead of dying, you awake for the first time that you can ever remember, a true awakening. And you awake to find that you really are in Golgotha. And that's where you are. And then you know at that moment what is taking place. And you come right out to find the wise one's presence. And they, they find the infant child, just as you are told. And a scripture tells you what people skip over the word sign. And this shall be a sign unto you. But you go to church this coming Christmas and they'll have the little sign, but they don't call it a sign. They call that the fact. And people will bow before the little child. The child is only the sign of your redemption. You were the one who awoke. You were the one who were born from above. And you are the one of whom the evangelist wrote. That Christ in you is the one of whom they speak. And the whole thing is told there, you experience, and the whole story is your story. But as you read it, and as it's interpreted by the, those who talk from the pulpit, you will never know it. And they wonder why they are still so confused today. It will go on and on and on until actually man comes to the truth of it all and he comes to it from within himself so to go back if you have the concordance don't take anything for granted just simply turn to the word look it up you need not know one word of Greek or one word of Hebrew it gives you a number you look up the number if it is in the Old Testament you look up the section under the Old Testament for definition. If it is in the new, you turn to the Greek. And you look it up under the Greek. And it takes the number. It will show you the Greek word and the pronunciation of the word. But you need not bother with that. Look up the number, then take the definition as given you, not in Greek. It defines it in your own tongue, in English. And you will see how many definitions of the sim one simple word are there and why that shows the one that they did. So, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the pure in heart is simply the consequence, not the condition. 
or seeing God. Seeing God produces automatically, instantly, the pure heart, which is nothing more than the purging of the mind of all beliefs in secondary causes, clearing the mind of all obstructions, leaving you completely alone, that God is all that there is, and all is God. Now let us go into the silence. Another friend who was here tonight, she said she heard a voice, didn't see anyone, saw nothing, just the voice. The voice said to her, you will be called and sent, and you will not return. You will be sent in two. Well, that's scripture. You will be sent while you are here. You have a long time here. But you will not return, not only here, but return to this age, whether it's beyond the so-called grave or not. You will not return to this world, terrestrial world. But you'll be sent in prayers, but you're told that in Scripture. And they came back, the 70, but they're all sent out in twos. 